Welcome to Harnessing Our Collective Stories, a transnational issue. Today's panel platica is for Shinachli Comadres National Colectiva's Day of Action. The Colectiva will engage its network in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Day of Action in response to the call from the National Indigenous Women's Resource Center's 2022 National Week of of action for murdered and missing indigenous women. Our campaign theme, Harnessing Our Collective Stories, will focus on uplifting and expanding upon the transnational context of violence against native and indigenous women and girls, femicides, gender-based violence, and the collective stories that connect the northern and southern movements. Thank you for joining us and we will now pass it on for opening remarks. Nixi ikini wa nawa nataka mari marasul kosamalo. Bienvenidos a todos. Me llamo Mari, Mari Azul Kosamalo. Welcome to all. My name is Mari, Marasul Kosamalo. We are in deep gratitude to the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and gender expansive families, communities, and loved ones who have suffered the pain and loss of a loved one who has gone missing or murdered. We honor the tenderness of this work and recognize that many impacted folks are on the front lines fighting for the silent stories of their loved ones. May our collective rage and grief be held and supported as we uplift this important issue. May our collective joy and love be uplifted as we do this work in honor of our loved ones. We honor and uplift the native and indigenous movement builders, weavers, healers, storytellers, activists, and advocates who have tirelessly dedicated themselves to raising awareness and advocating for solutions to eradicating gender-based violence against native and indigenous women, girls, femmes, trans, and gender expansive folks. Lastly, we are here in deep gratitude to our funder, grant makers, for girls of color, for your capacity building support, for our 2022 Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls campaign. Before I introduce our moderator, I would like us to all acknowledge the land, the earth, upon where you are. I currently am on the land of the previous caretakers, the Tongva people. And I'd like to honor the land that I'm on and that you're on wherever you are and begin by giving thanks to the east direction. The east direction is where the sun rises, where we start our new days, our new beginnings. It is in deep gratitude to the east direction. Where we breathe our first breaths. I turn and I give thanks to the south direction the direction of the youth, of the little beings, our future, to the water that cleanses us, that gives us life. I turn inwardly and I look to the west direction. This is where the sun sets. This is where all of our suns set and what we do, 
between the east direction and the west direction in our lives. That is what matters. I pray that we all live beautiful lives. We live in beauty and respect and honor. And we use that fire to burn, to burn and to light the pathways for change, to clear the past, to also create new beginnings. I turn inward to the north where our ancestors guide us, where we remember them, where we remember Mother Earth and know that we are never alone and she is always holding us, always holding us and always deserves our respect. I look upward to the cosmos, to our maps, to our guides, to the star beings. I look below my feet, our beautiful mother. I look inward to our hearts, our collective heart. In this, I give gratitude. And now it is with great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's panel platica, Dr. Patty Ramirez. Dr. Pari Ramirez is a Chicana Indígena Salvadoreña activist and transnational social worker. Dr. Patty is the founder of Calibri, a grassroots healing centered leadership development organization. Dr. Patti believes that reimagining how we heal and lead will increase sustainability of social justice leaders, organizations, and social justice movements. For nearly a decade, Dr. Patty has dedicated her work to advocating against gender-based violence and serving immigrant victims of crime and justice impacted folks. Dr. Patty's path to violence prevention was directly related to her own experience as a victim of sexual violence. She became committed to prevention and education work around sexual and domestic violence stalking, dating violence, and gender-based violence, including the femicides in Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexica. Dr. Patty's experiences range from working with victims of sexual or domestic violence, unaccompanied children, victims of trafficking, and asylum seekers. She also has engaged in reproductive justice, criminal justice policy advocacy, program and cur curriculum development, and organizational development. She is also a founding member of the survivor-led Los Angeles Crime Victors Advisory Board. It is my honor to introduce her to you. Thank you, Marasul Cosamalo, for your beautiful opening remarks and beautiful land and ancestral acknowledgement. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Patty Ramirez, and it is truly an honor and a privilege to introduce today's panelists to you all. Cristina Flores is a trained She Naturally Rites of Passage facilitator and a consultant at Colibri. Cristina is obtaining her bachelor's in film and social justice from Mount St. Mary's. She hopes to pursue her passion to tell her community stories and inspire young artists to tell their stories and take more space in the industry because there aren't enough women of color filmmakers. Cristina enjoys connecting with nature and grounding with her medicine. Cristina has been on her healing journey of connecting back to herself with support from her community. Welcome, Cristina. Sara Husky Mendoza is a curriculum author for She Naturally Youth Rites of Passage. Sara has worked over 25 years as a grassroots community organizer, trainer, and outreach specialist. 
Sana developed She Naturally, an innovative youth health and rites of passage curriculum for young women, girls, and femme-identified folks, as well as gender-expansive youth. She is a fellow of the California Women's Policy Institute and a recipient of the 2007 Los Angeles AFSC Peacemaker Award. Sara worked as a fundraising trainer for the Grassroots Institute for Fundraising and completed 10 years with the National Compadres Network. She has served as a field representative for the International Indian Treaty Council, working at the UN Commission for Human Rights in Geneva, Switzerland. Her work is centered on the wellness and development of girls and facilitating intergenerational healing spaces through the Shinachli Comadres National Colectiva. Additional work includes disseminating the Shinachli Rites of Passage curriculum, grassroots fundraising training, indigenous leadership, and capacity building, specifically for women and girls. Sara has extensive experience working with communities and organizations. Welcome, Sara. Kimberly Bautista is a Colombian-American award-winning writer, director, and producer. Her feature-length documentary film titled Justice for My Sister about femicide in Guatemala was broadcast on PBS stations and Telesur. The film screened in 20 countries to audiences who also received training in violence prevention with the trauma-informed curriculum that Kimberly authored. Over 15,000 live audience members partook in the community screening and trainings, and over 100,000 people saw the film on television broadcasts. As a result of community organizing and the film's multi-year tour, she founded the arts nonprofit Justice for My Sister Collective to train youth to make films that transform trauma into healing in order to promote racial equity and gender justice. Kimberly is a fierce champion of youth leadership, human rights, and the arts to promote healing and social change. Kimberly obtained her bachelor's from Pitzer College and her MFA from University of California, Santa Cruz in social documentary. Welcome, Kimberly. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Doctora Silvia Toscano. Doctora Silvia is a Chicana Mexicana who is self-actualizing through ancestral cosmic connections, seeking to undo colonizing stigmas surrounding empowerment of feminine energies and creative expressions. Her ancestry is rooted in Michoacán, Durango, and Chihuahua, Mexico. She earned her PhD in Chicana and Chicano Studies from UC Santa Barbara in 2016 and has over 20 years of teaching experience at the community college as well as high school and university levels, where she centers culturally relevant and responsive curriculums in the service of humanizing pedagogies of transformation. Her recent work is contributing author and co-editor of in Search of Our Brown Selves, a Transdisciplinary College Reader. Welcome, Dr. Silvia, and thank you to all of our panelists who are here with us today. Hello, buenas tardes. Uh, soy Sara Arelia Haski Mendoza. I am from the Shanashli Rites of Passage, and I'm calling today from Aztec, New Mexico, so traditional homelands of the Diné people and... Uh, ancestral homelands of, of the Anazazi. And so that's important for, for my story uh, and why I, I live now here in, in this moment uh, and in this place. So I'm happy to be here. Me llamo Cristina Flores. Um, my name is Cristina. Um, I am calling from, from the Tongva land um, and I am a trained um, Sinachli Rites of Passage facilitator. Um, I'm also a emerging youth activist and a student filmmaker in hopes to tell our stories, in hopes to tell um, 
um, our community stories and also to uplift uh, um, other youth to be part of this work, you know, Ometeo. Hola, Piali. Muy buenas tardes o días. Me llamo Doctora Silvia Toscano. It's an honor to be here. I'm calling in from Gabrielino Keach Nation. Um, I am a professor at Pasadena City College, and I have lived in Baldwin Park, the San Gabriel Valley, for almost all of my life. And I am just very grateful to be in this space, to be sharing space, and ask permission of the elements of all the guides that we have at our in our surroundings and to be in dialogue about this very important issue with all of you that are here present on the call as well as those of you that will be sharing space with us. Hi, I'm Kimberly Bautista. I'm calling in from Tongva land here in the San Gabriel Valley. Really grateful to be here. Grateful to share space with each of you. And I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I'm the founder and executive director of Justice for My Sister. And we started as a grassroots organization. We're currently a nonprofit in LA um, providing job training and job opportunities to emerging filmmakers of color, primarily survivors of gender-based violence, uh, former foster youth and systems impacted folks. Really grateful to be here. Hola compañeras. Um, the first question that I have for all of you is, why is the Murdered Missing Indigenous Women and Girls campaign important for you? And so this question will be for all of you and feel free to unmute if you would like to respond. Okay. <clears throat> Buenas tardes, uh, Patti. My name is Sara. Um, uh, on my side of my, my dad, I am Nyanyu. And on the side of my mother, I'm uh, Nawa. And <clears throat> I identify Chicana. For me, uh, the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls issue is so alive, um, mainly because over 500 years ago, we've had colonial deadly policies that have affected my life today, you know, in 2022. Um, the doctrine of discovery, right? The Popo Bowl. Um, President Lincoln had the scorched earth policy, you know, here in the U.S. Um, in Mexico, you know, Cortez was, was convinced that the gold was, you know, lost somewhere in Xochimilco. And so as the families that lived in Xochimilco were, were departing and fleeing, you know, the, the conquistadores, ¿verdad? the policy was rape, that no one left Xochimilco without being raped. And so <clears throat> that creates our society today where we're still not safe walking down the street and uh, we have to be in charge of our own safety versus society being in charge of making sure that the predators don't exist, right? And so for me, that's one of the biggest issues is that um, it has manifested, the trauma created by these, by these policies have manifested in my life specifically. And, um, and I'd love to share more about that, but I wanna hear about the other, other compañeras. So, le paso la palabra. Con permiso, I can go next, doctora. And this issue, this subject is really close to my heart. Um, also, you know, thank you, Sara, for contextualizing this within the colonial patriarchal framework. You know, my ancestors come from Durango, Tepehuanes del Sur, Cualcomán, Michoacán, and Cusiguriachi, Chihuahua. And I also identify as Chicana. And I grew up, you know, hearing stories being normalized about um, women being kidnapped. Se la robaron was a very um, common theme. And so I just wanted to honor my bisabuela Prisciliana, who was taken 
um, at the age of 14 or 15, and she died during her second, second childbirth. And so just kind of having that history to um, be birthed into and having it normalized. And like Sara also said, that went on to impact my own life, my own patterns. Um, on my mother's side, um, I have a great tia, tia Carmen, who was also impacted severely by domestic violence and was, you know, beaten always um, on a consistent basis by her husband. She developed, you know, um, many health conditions in response to the stressors that she was having to undergo. And so just within my own um, familial history, not too far back, you know, this, um, this pattern of violence, which then manifested in my own um, patterns of behavior and um, entering into relationships of domestic violence también as an adolescent. So for those personal reasons, um, like familial wise, it speaks to me because I've been impacted by them. Um, there are also more local reasons, but I'll, I'll save that for um, to share later. That's come up. Thank you so much, Patti, for the space. Uh, I'm Kimberly Bautista, and really grateful to be here. I'm representing um, my father's lineage. He is a Colombian immigrant, and my mother, who is uh, Irish American, and just really grateful for the opportunity to recognize um, my own positionality and my own privilege here, right? Living in the belly of the beast and what that entails. Um, as a student, I, when I learned what was happening um, in Juarez, I felt outraged. I felt outraged that I didn't know it was happening before going to college. Um, I felt very in the dark, like, you know, this institution, this government, right, this state that I inhabit is, is creating conditions for other women to be vulnerable um, and subject to victim blaming in a way that is so entrenched. Uh, and so I felt like a sense of responsibility to speak up for those who couldn't uh, because they had been disappeared. And um, I learned about the women of Juarez from a documentary, Senorita Extraviada by Lourdes Portillo, who's a Chicana and she lives in the Bay. And so that really activated my, my student activism and, um, you know, using art, use, I made a, uh, I made a painting that turned into a t-shirt that turned into a student club, right? We made a mural, we made a community quilt. Uh, we were coordinating and, and organizing with, with, um, with families in Juarez and fundraising for them. And so that was the transnational activism that led me to then expanding and connecting with other feminists in Latin America, and like leveraging my ability to tell stories um, to really elevate the movements that were happening that, that you know, were um, just so powerful to, to really speak out against femicide. And so I'm grateful to be able to, to be here and share about that. My name is Cristina Flores. Um, my mom is Mexican and my dad is um, Salvadorian. And um, this work is so important to me because, you know, growing up, you know, in high school, we heard about our history as if, it does not happen, but um, being part of Sinachli, being part of Colibrid, and then also, you know, um, having the personal experience um, in my community with a lot of women missing and their names are not being uplifted um, has made me angry. It's made me angry about the fact that I... I was not involved sooner enough, but I am so thankful that I was invited. Um, and I'm also thankful for our uh, maestras. And also um, just going back to school to Mount St. Mary's has, has also opened a lot of, you know, um, opportunities 
to learn more, right? And um, as a student filmmaker, it's important that these stories are uplifted and that these names are heard, right? So um, with that being said, Ometeo, and also thank you. So this next question is uh, for Cristina. What would you say is your why for doing this work? My why is because um, I want to I want to encourage other youth activists um, to be part of this work. Um, I want to, I want our stories to be heard. I want um, our community to get justice because it's been, it's been history and it repeats. Our history has been repeating and there's also not enough youth activists, right? So I want to inspire others to be part of this work. And I also um, want to uplift um, these unheard stories. And I want to learn more as well. I'm Thank you, Christina. Sarah, I would love to know, um, you know, what is your why for doing this work and, and what do you hope to inspire in, you know, the next generation like Cristina's? Muchas gracias. The why of why, you know, I exist and why I do this work. Um, I think I was 15 when I knew that whatever I learned, I wanted to share it with whoever didn't know. And uh, once I started college at 15, I was 15 years old, um, I just received more language in order to describe my reality, to re be able to describe um, issues that were affecting me directly, issues that were uh, very much created by white supremacy. <clears throat> and so as a young girl coming from a very uh, women empowered family, it was natural for me to, to get involved, to get educated, to share my voice. Uh, then eventually you get voted into leadership roles. I was a Metro president at 16. Um, and, and then you look around and you're wondering, why aren't there more female leaders around me? And then you begin to talk to people and you begin to realize that not everyone grows up in a female empowered home where our voice is key and knowing how to advocate and even fight for ourselves is that was like my grandma used to say you you better learn how to fight or I'm gonna beat you you know it was like that it was like you fight and defend yourself because this is how you're gonna walk the earth and and so it became um really interesting to me as a teenager to look around and see that other girls didn't have this this type of uh, education and so I think I've dedicated my life to just making sure that girls know that we have the right to um, have a, a strong voice. We have the right, you know, to have leadership roles. And, you know, I, I really would love to see a society that is led by um, healing informed women. You know, uh, I'm not happy where we are in the world right now. Uh, I'm, I'm very scared of, of what, these uh, governments are doing. And so I think that we need to influence leadership. And so what would it take for girls to reach their full potential? And that's, that's my journey. And one of the, one of the most important things of our issue here is safety. That safety has to be primary. So I fight for that safety myself too, in, in my personal life. And so it's extremely important that um, we tell our stories that we, we come out and share that, Hey, you know, we haven't reached the level of safety that we need as a society, you know, and be able to describe how that looks like for each one of us. Thank you. Gracias, Sara. Can you share more about how um, you do that through the Shinachali Rites of Passage work? <clears throat> yes, one of the goals for me was, how do I learn my culture? How do I go to ceremonies, you know? And you go to these amazing ceremonies with these beautiful, you know, spiritual, uh, you know, chiefs, if you will. And 
then you go back to your job yeah, and you're like, how do I share this with the young people I'm working with? And so from that question sparked uh, a curriculum I wrote called Shinachli. And uh, in there is like, hey, you know, how do you take care of yourself from not getting HIV? You know, how do you really take care of yourself, you know, developing your own voice and your own identity, right? Like someone can say, well, be a good girl. What, what does that mean to you? May not be what it means to me, right? And so I need girls to be able to feel empowered, to be able to decide what kind of women they want to become. And so Shanachli is a 16 week uh, curriculum and it's cyclical. So you do 16 weeks and if you're able to stay with the same group of girls, you go, you know, you go over and over it uh, with the same group of girls, because <clears throat> even though the theme may, may be the same, let's say today we're doing the, you know, dating violence theme. Uh, even if we repeat the theme in a few months or so, each time we repeat it, we're coming at it from a different time and space. And so we get to learn a different aspect of it. And so 16 weeks can turn into 32 and those 32, you know, get multiplied. But our goal is just to really support young girls and femme youth to be able to reach their full potential and for uh, to be trucha. You know, at the end of the day, it's like, how I, you know, how can you be trucha? Because most of the sexual assaults that we see in our society happen at the university. And so just because, you know, our, our kids are making it there doesn't mean they're safe, right? And so um, this curriculum is really about getting girls to be trucha about who they are, where they want to be. And, and at the same time, to be able to, to create, you know, defensive factors where they won't be easily affected by, let's say, cyberbullying, right? That all of us at any age could become a victim of, right? So that's what we work on. And should actually think. So, you know, we hear that one in three women worldwide have experienced physical or sexual violence. But we also know that statistics um, fail to capture the, the real scope of the problem. And so my question for, for you, Sara, um, I'll begin with you, is what are some of the narratives that you have heard or that have been passed down your family, in your community, in your culture related to uh, murdered and missing indigenous women and girls? So the stories that I have heard and I have um, witnessed um, is something that Dr. Silvia mentioned, and it has to do with se la robaron. The common practice that a male has the right over a female's body. And the moment that he violates that body, the whole family, you know, to avoid embarrassment or shame, will now marry off the, this girl to the rapist. <clears throat> and so it's not just uh, urban legend or not, and it's not really urban, but it's rural legend, right? That it happens, but it's not just um, my story. It's so many of our stories. And so um, I also have an abuelita, Juanita, and she was, you know, kidnapped and taken, you know, across the border to the North and never saw her family again. You know, she was, um, we want to say 12 or 13 years old when she was taken and, you know, had five, six children, um, eventually got abandoned and was living under a bridge, you know, until her, until her child found her and saved her. Really tragic lives <clears throat> of Indigenous women being kidnapped and, and having no choice in their life, right? No other choices that they got to make, not how many children they had, not where they lived, not if they saw their parents again, right? They had absolutely no choice. It was decided for them. And so that's a story that continues to happen in small pueblos. Absolutely. And that's in Mexico and in Central America. Thank you for that response, Sara. Um, yes, I, I know I have heard um, stories even you know, kind of, even from my own grandfather, who's from Chihuahua, Mexico, who like jokingly will say like, oh, me la voy a robar. You know, and it's it's this, you know, continuous um, a 
culture that perpetuates violence against women, right? So when I was um, at UC Santa Barbara doing um, violence prevention work, we, we talked about it as rape culture. It's, it's, which is rooted in patriarchy and white supremacy and machismo. Um, and we see, we see this show up in, with our, you know, family members as stories that have been passed down our lineage. Um, but even as within our communities and our cultures, right, it gets romanticized, if you will, um, to be kidnapped and, and robbed um, for, you know, for, for a romantic or sexual um, experience. It's, it really takes away from the fact that that is gender-based violence, that is femicide, that is rape, that is missing and murdered indigenous women, right? So I want to ask you, Doctora Silvia, if you can um, share a little bit more about some of the stories that you have heard um, or that even in your work, um, you know, as, as, as an adjunct professor, um, what are some narratives um, that you've seen within the movimiento? Yes, so, you know, growing up, I'll reiterate the story of my bisabuela Prisciliana Cárdenas, who was taken, um, se la robaron, uh, somebody probably 10, 15 years older than her, right, um, en caballo, se la llevó, and um, that was, you know, my great grandmother, my paternal um, uh, great grandmother so my father's abuela and she also did not you know have any contact with her family and she eventually ended up dying in childbirth after giving um, birth to her second child so her life you know was cut short and um the fact that she became somebody's property you know her body her mind her spirit um, her emotions, right? She became the property of, of this male who was dando por todos lados, you know, in caballo. And I'm sure she was not the only one. I'm sure she was not the last one. I'm sure she wasn't the only one. Um, and so just that normalization of, you know, um, dominant patriarchal males being able to do whatever they want and have ultimate power and say so over um you know the feminine the feminine beings and then losing value you know after um being taken and um losing your innocence to this older man you know then losing your value after that um this has many psychological impacts you know um i know for sure that's just one that's just on my dad's side there's also the narrative of mi tia carmen um, my maternal um, abuela, like her, her sister, um, and, you know, era, tenía un esposo abusivo. And it was just, you know, beat downs and getting hit in the head and getting locked in places and getting thrown from here to there. And just like the normalization of that type of conversation. Um, there were never discussions with me about, you know, how to prevent that, how to be aware that that may be a pattern that you may fall into, you know, um, domestic violence is not okay. Those conversations didn't happen. And so I grew up um, also just having that very normalized and having the, the male uh, dominant voice, you know, Sarah had mentioned earlier, um, the awareness that she had in learning that not everybody comes from, you know, uh, maternal strength, it, it, like it's there, but, um, you know, my mom has had to navigate, you know, certain types of abuse in, in a, an emotional sense. Um, and she is a strong woman, but in a different way, you know, she's had to learn to navigate. So I just grew up watching all of this and having it normalized for me and absolutely led to my own um, patterns of domestic violence. And I think it's also an important opportunity to bring into the conversation codependency. Right. And the fact that we enter sometimes into relationships um, or situations because of these patterns that we've inherited. This is the intergenerational historical trauma for sure. 
um, you know, but it hasn't really been situated in that way. Um, the conversations, at least that I've been a part of through my my teaching and my and my my own you know work in at a doctoral program, it's still very hidden. This aspect of the domestic violence, you know, and the crimes against women is still kind of buried very deep within those conversations. So I think within my own work, it's been important to allow students to have the space to reflect um, and really in, be introspective about their history, their familial um, you know, histories and how those uh, continue to shape their behaviors and their thought processes. And so as we're advocating for you know, um, transformation and lib liberatory outcomes, I think it's really important to have students uh, give, to allow students the space and time to think about how history has impacted them personally and to really allow them the space to um, process and think and to do so in a safe, you know, and nurturing way. Thank you. Thank you. So I heard, um, what I heard in, in the responses was that some of the stories that we may have heard is how it's happening you know, back then, back um, with our grandparents, with our great grandparents, maybe even in our home countries. Um, and so I, I just want to uplift like a dominant narrative that it doesn't happen here, that it only happens there. And the reality is that um, that's not true, right? We know that uh, gender based violence is happening here. It's happening across, you know, the, the Alaska, Canada, all the way, you know, down North America to Central America, the Northern Triangle of Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. And so um, I would love to hear um, from you, Kimberly. Uh, I know that you, through your work with Justice for My Sister, um, you did some um, work around the femicide in Guatemala. Can you share more about that work and, and you know, some of the things that surfaced as a result? Uh, so one of the, the, the things that actually brought me to Guatemala was connecting with activists who were organizing transnationally, right? And so um, connecting with Mujeres Iniciando en las Americas, Mia, um, and other organizations, then that led me, you know, that I got connected to um, El Sector de Mujeres, Grupo Guatemalteco de Mujeres. And a lot of the movement at that time was actually uh, rectifying the Ley contra, contra el Femicidio. And that was really important to actually codify, like what is this crime and how, and what are the conditions that define this, right? And here in the United States, we don't have that. We don't have a, a law against femicide. We don't, we don't look at the indicators of um, the ways that, you know, um, the factors of brutality around these, these crimes, the factors of isolation of domestic violence abuse that lead to the cycle of violence, right? That, that leads in this extreme form of, of, of gender-based violence. And so, I think um, it's very true as, you know, uh, it's very true that we tend to export the issue and, and act as if it only happens there. Um, but I think that in a way that's almost like a result of the fact that there is a really strong women's movement in Guatemala. There's a really strong women's movement in Honduras, in Nicaragua, right? That they're actually identifying these 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 not only like trends within a relationship, um, if it is a domestic violence murder, but also like the landscape at large of um, these issues around victim blaming on an institutional level and how that almost leads to the justification, right, of these murders um, in Guatemala. The story that I covered is about uh, Rebecca Eunice Perez and her sister Adela. And Adela was murdered by her ex-boyfriend who was essentially stalking her. And um, he, and I wanna just, you know, um, 
thank you all for holding space for this story because it, I do want to you know, encourage you to brace yourself because it, it's a heavy one. Um, she was left on the side of the road and abandoned and to the point where she was, she was unrecognizable. And when the authorities arrived to the scene, they basically said, oh, well, she must have been, andaban malos pasos, you know, she must have been una mujer de la calle or, or like a sex worker, right? And a lot of times that's the way that the system tries to discount the importance of these crimes. And it's like, regardless if she was a sex worker, nobody deserves to experience something like that. Nobody's life is discardable, right? And so it's really important that um, we're able to really center the fact that yes, th th this does happen here in the United States as well. And um, at the same time, we don't have the same, the same movements that are naming it in the same way. So um, one of the other stories that, that I want to name here in the space is um, when we were doing student activism with Mujeres de Juarez um, and really elevating those cases, one of the organizations that we were working with was Nuestras Hijas de Regreso a Casa. And Maricela Escobedo was one of the organizers from that movement. Her sister Ruby, or her, I'm sorry, her daughter Ruby had been murdered. And so Maricela Escobedo was camping out day and night in front of the, the justice system, in front of that, that installation. And um, she was murdered during her, her vigil, right? Holding space for her daughter's case and demanding that the person who had actually confessed, he had confessed, right? That he had, that he had um, been responsible for her disappearance and murder. And all the same, the judges excused him. So I think what we see time and again is in Latin America, um, folks have the courage to speak out and to name what's happening despite that their lives are at risk. There is not a witness protection program like there is here, right? There aren't the systems to actually protect witnesses in the same way. Um, so I just see time and again, people really having the courage and it, and it also happens that people are silenced too, because those systems of support don't exist. Um, but I think just knowing the, the stakes and yet people are still speaking out. Survivors are still speaking out. The, those who have lost loved ones are still taking a stand um, and, and pushing for these laws to be put in place, right? There's also a, a Le Contra el Feminicidio in Colombia, even in, in Argentina, right? Like, so there's this massive movement from like 2007 on where women's rights movements have really been pushing for ending gender-based violence and, and, and codifying it in the penal law. Kimberly, do you think it's, I mean, it has to be the, the, the gun, the gun owners, right. That are fighting that because here in the United States, I mean, most women die at the, at the guns of their partners. Right. So policy wise, I think, I think the NRI must be really pushing against any kind of law like that. Cause then that would mean that they have to control the guns. No. Anyway, just a reflection. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, you know, I want I want to just uplift the the U.S. based and Canada based um, murdered and missing Indigenous women campaign, uh, which resulted in response to the families' actions and demands for justice following the disappearance and murder of Hannah Harris at the Northern Cheyenne Re Reservation in 2013. And so the Montana Congressional Delegation led the work to pass the first Senate resolution declaring May 5th as a National Day of Awareness for missing and murdered Native women and girls. And so this happened in 2017, right? And so we've been seeing a lot of these um, 
movements um, since then uh, continuing to push policy advocacy around um, more uh, data um, around this issue because we know that there's not enough data around like the actual scope of the problem. Um, and so um, acts like Savannah's Act and the Not Invisible Act are two of the policies that are currently being um, amplified within this um, movement in here in the U.S. And so the next question is for you, Sara. Um, how do we act as a bridge for the northern and southern movements? Well, I, I believe that this is a very complicated issue because we don't have the numbers, right? We don't really know what the numbers are for indigenous women and, and girls. Uh, the Harvard International Review, they're reporting that 70% of all trafficked people in Mexico are indigenous women and girls, 70% of the traffic. And so this data is, um, it's very interesting for us to look at, but we need to talk to each other. And so I believe that one of the things that we can do is continue to come together. We speak Spanish, we speak English, and many communities, you know, they only speak English in their own language or Spanish in their own language. And so we, we can definitely be part of the conversation. Um, and, and we have a role in that conversation because what's happening in the South is a direct impact of policies coming from the North, right? And so what happens in Mexico and Central America, the U.S. is very much involved in those decision makings. And so uh, we know that. And so, you know, being part of that um, direct policy action that's directed by local movements and for us to be able to share that conversation and be able to support each other, each other's campaigns, I think it's, it's also very, very much key. Um, yeah, besides coming together and communicating and talking and sharing our stories and finding our commonalities, I think that nothing else can happen until we do that. Thank you, Sara. Yes, being able to come together, to communicate, to support one another's uh, local actions, uh, transnational actions, um, that is those are very key um, action items that we can do to be that bridge. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the transnational scope of the issue. And, you know, my next question is for Dr. Silvia. How have you seen this issue of um, missing, murdered indigenous women and girls, femicidios, and even gender based violence unfold locally? Thank you, Dr. Yes, I want to just create space for. Uh, a murder that happened locally. And um, I was very, it hit very, very close to home. So this happened April 20th, 2016 in the city where I currently live, um, Baldwin Park, California. And it happened at a tiendita, a little store, you know, that's a corner store called La Blanquita Market. And I've always gone to that stores you know I've lived in Baldwin Park since I was two years old so that's the corner you know market and um, on that day I had dropped off my son at school and it's a couple blocks away and he was needing something for his class project like marshmallows or something and so I said oh I'll stop at La Blanquita you know on my way to go put gas or something um, so I did, I stopped, you know, we start school at 8.05 or something. So I, I went in, got the marshmallows and, and left. And I think I went to go put gas and then was coming back home. And I saw the yellow tape, you know, around the store. And it was like just a few minutes that I had just exited that store. And what I later found out was that one of the workers, um, they had, uh, you know, like you could buy comida, you could buy some food, tacos and stuff, um, there's a store and then there's a little part where you can buy the food. And so Leticia de la Torre Castillo was um, murdered that morning by her uh, former husband. And they had been married for about 20 years and they had four children. And um, he walked up to her and shot her in the head and then shot himself. And when I learned those details, it floored me, not only because I had you know, it happened at 8.13 a.m. 
So it was just a few minutes um, after I left. I don't know if he was in the store when I when I was in there. Um, you know, but when I learned about it, it floored me because, you know, I was that close to being there, but then it also reminded me of the things that I have endured, you know, and the, that close to something happening to me too. And, um, you know, being in an abusive relationship from the age of about 16 to about 21, um, and having my life threatened, you know, being taken up to the mountains and um, being told that they're going to kill me, they're going to kill my family, um, you know, if I leave or I say anything. And that's not something that I've said um, in any kind of public way. So it's just really important, you know, to make... Um, it okay to talk about these things and to support one another uh, when we're enduring things like this, you know. Um, nothing was really said about it after the store, you know, opened the next day and um, everybody went on with their life. Menos Leticia. So, you know, whatever we can do, I know that this, I remember hearing in the, in the conversations um, about this space, that it, this is like the, the kickoff and that it's gonna grow, you know, um, from this point forward. So I think that what Sara said about just having to be involved in the conversations that are here at a local level, but also the national level and the international level también. Thank you. Thank you, Doctora Silvia, for um, you know just sharing your your story and um, ultimately for uplifting that the need again for us to talk about and uplift our stories stories that have you know gone silent for for so long or stories that have been silenced as well. Um, so with that said, I actually wanted to invite Christina. Um, is there anything that you would like to add to how you have seen this issue unfold locally or personally, or just in any way that you feel called to share? The way that this issue has unfolded, um, in my community, in my life, has been through personal experience, has been through work environments, friendships, and um, being a victim and of being stalked, of, of almost losing my life due to a, you know, accident that was on purpose. Um, I can't do it. I'm sorry. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for trying. Oh, it's you're okay, awesome. Christina. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We're here holding space for you. You know, one of the, the, the reminders that we all, um, you know, held and, and that surfaced was that this work is deeply personal and it's also deeply re-traumatizing um, for folks. And so, you know, we invited um, my, my little sister. Christina. Um, who who is here to share her youth voice um, and in the midst of the platica um, was you know triggered and reactivated 
because this is very tender as all of our stories are and so we opted to lean into community care and to be with one another and hold um, Christina who has opted not to continue to share responses to some of the other questions. Um, but this is the work of being healing centered work. When we make space for the narratives of stories to surface, we have to be prepared to support when re-traumatization happens. And so I just want to um, acknowledge the beautiful panel of intergenerational mujeres of medicine, of voices, that although we did not stay silent today and, and through our work we uplifted the many stories around us, we also made it part of our platica to hold space for the tenderness and for the grief to surface. So thank you to all the panelists here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you who have shared your um, stories the narratives of your mothers, your grandmothers, your great grandmothers, and your lineage. Um, I truly am just so inspired by the heart rootedness of this platica um, and just inspired by all of the amazing work that each and every one of you do um, to to amplify um, the the movement to end um, gender-based violence to end femicides and to um, denounce just violence against a native and indigenous women and girls. A lot of these stories are very tender and it can be really difficult to not walk away from this platica without taking these stories with us. And so the invitation is for us to find ways to pour warmth back into ourselves to connect with medicine and to tend to the needs that surface for all of us that tune into this platica, but also for all of our panelists and storytellers and weavers and advocates and healers. And so I ask, you know, the compañeras here this last question, and this is for all of you. How can we bring healing to the tenderness and the grief around this work of ending the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls epidemic, the femicides, and ultimately the work to end gender-based violence. Doctora, con su permiso, I'd like to go. Um, I wanted to use this as an opportunity to also um, just backtrack and say a couple of things that I didn't get a chance to say earlier. I think one of the first things is to acknowledge um, the acknowledgement of these crimes at the national and the international level. Um, There's so many statistics out there, even though they may be incorrect and incomplete, but we can still, you know, inform ourselves and just be aware of the inaccuracies um, in the in the information that comes out to us. I personally wanted to acknowledge the 13 year anniversary of the West Mesa murders in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, this case started in 2009 and you know 11 remains of women and an unborn child were found in, a, in these like a construction site. And so many of the women like, um, that I had named before, Leticia from Baldwin Park and, and a lot of the women here in, in New Mexico were identified as Latinas or Mestizas. Um, and just to acknowledge, you know, the, the misinformation that that label sometimes or oftentimes or all the time mm -hmm. 
conveys, you know, it really does de-indigenize and contributes to the detribalization of, um, of people who have indigenous origins, you know, in the North and in the South. Um, so I just want to acknowledge those 11 women um, and just make space for that as now. Um, as part of the acknowledgement, también what's happening um, continues to happen in Juarez, you know, um, they have a new Fiscalía Especializada de la Mujer. It's a new unit, um, Crimes Against Women unit. Um, but 172 murders in 2019, 192 murders in 2020, 127. You know, it's um, at around 20, in the year 2020, it was um, also high, you know, murders in that area, almost 1,700. And so just acknowledging those, those facts are really important, but also our responses to that, you know, um, and sharing my story and hearing the stories of my sisters and the, the work that's being done here. I remember the, a quote um, from, a, from a short film called La Tiricia. And she's saying, um, I believe it's Alisa. She says, tengo un hoyo en la panza. You know, I have a hole in my stomach. Y un miedo como de chivo antes que lo maten, the fear of a goat before they kill it. And her mother reminds her, acknowledges the fact that she's dirisienta, that she um, is sick from her soul. And um, I think just acknowledging the soul woundedness of this reality is really important. Um, it's not just the physical part, but it's the emotional, it's the mental, and it's the spiritual, for sure, the soul wounding. Um, and that, yes, we absolutely have to um, bring gentleness and tenderness to these spaces, you know. And I think um, something that helps me is to remember the tools and technologies of my ancestors, you know, the maize based philosophies, calling upon you know, the four directions, inviting the personajes of Tezcalipoca, Huitzilopochtli, Xipetotec, and Quetzalcoatl um, as tools of self-reflection and self-introspection and being able to return to balance. Um, you know, continuing to think about bringing healing and tenderness to the grief. I also want to acknowledge um, my brothers, my sons, my partner, my father, the male energies in my life. Um, I know that they need a lot of healing too. I know that it's difficult for them to find space to do so. Um, so I just wanted to just acknowledge that and it's difficult también, you know, to unlearn and relearn and to be vulnerable. I think that's really important. And I'll end with a poem that I wrote um, in thinking about this, you know, how to bring healing and tenderness to the grief that we're sharing together. We are here in community where I can be held here. I can be vulnerable. I can co-create, I can support, I can learn, I can accept, I can connect. I can find the strength in my stories, my voice, my medicine, my healing, my journey. That's come up. Mm, that's so beautiful. Thank you, Dr. Silvia. <clears throat> Sarah, would you like to go next? My um, my elder. She, uh, Roseanne Rodriguez, she, she's always taught us, you know, that we can't be human beings, you know, without these four things, you know, we need the patience, the endurance, um, the courage, and the alertness. We need these four aspects to be full human beings, ¿verdad? And so today um, on my mind, I just have in mind these, like, these harmful, harmful policies that have created, um, for example, the war on drugs. In the early 2000s, a delegation of indigenous women from 
you know, El Salvador, from Colombia, were coming up to Los Angeles to tell us their story that they're being sprayed. They're constantly being sprayed um, in the campaign against drugs, of, you know, just killing the, the coca leaf or killing marijuana plants. It's on indigenous lands, indigenous, you know, ejidos, uh, um, collectively, you know, shared lands of indigenous families. And uh, because of the cartels and because of, of policies to, to fight, right, drugs and cartels, indigenous women and children are in the middle. And those are deeply affected. And, and you know, years later, cancer becomes also a weapon, right? An outcome of, of the spraying of pesticides on, on indigenous lands, on families. Um, I think of Luz Gonzalez, a, a, a four-year-old indigenous girl that got ran over in New Jersey. No one ever, you know, paid for it and, or got charged for her death. And so that wasn't too long ago, I believe that was four years ago. And what does that tell the collective psyche, you know, of, of our children, of who we are as indigenous women that no valemos, you know, that, that no government is gonna look out for us, right? These policies are not gonna look out for us. And so again, you know, I feel like women in leadership is, is Conscious women like us in leadership is what needs to happen in order to bring more humane, humanistic, más humano, um, a society, right? Based on policies that are based on, on taking care of our, you know, humanness, ¿verdad? Our love, our need for each other, our kinship, our, our women's circles, our men's circles, our, you know, our dance circles for our children. Um, I was telling my stapati that one of the tools for me is art. I need to be around artists. I need to see art I, because that's what feeds me, right? As I absorb it through my eyes and my ears, that's what heals me. And, and um, that's why the drum is so important in our cultures, right? It's, it's healing. And so our medicines are so important and, and taking care of them is so important. And, and, uh, and it's hard. It's hard because... Um, we see our medicines being sold everywhere, right? And so we're normalizing that sage, you can find it anywhere, right? One time I went to a gas station and there was sage in there. I was like, okay, what's going on? Right, the, the mass um, consumption and, and um, you know, consumption of something is, is not right either. That's not human, right? And so taking care of our medicines and, and taking care of our spirit, I think is, is key. And doing that through art for me, it's just so healing. It, it allows me to just take a breath of fresh air with new energy and positivity and, and keep moving forward with, with love at the center. ¿Verdad? How uh, Maestro Che Guevara said. So, mucho amor en el centro, en la revolución. I think um, holding space for the grief and the sorrow and the rage is so important. It's so important to be able to express and externalize that rage and grief. Um, I think I carry a, I carry a narrative of wanting to be the the strong warrior woman, and you know that kind of positioned me to not pause and not not process and to just kind of power through after. Um, after experiencing an attack, you know, after experiencing harm to myself and, um, and also like in that, I recognize that I, I trust my own process. Like at the time that was how I moved and that was how I needed to survive. So I think even if I couldn't hold that rage and that grief at the time, I trust that, that, that was how I needed to move, you know? And, um, and I think one of the things that has been really healing for me is creating community, creating community with other hermanas who are committed to speaking out, breaking the silence, you know? So 
this is really healing being able to share with you and hear your stories and denounce femicide, denounce gender-based violence, denounce what's happening, right? With the murder and missing indigenous women. Um, the fact that we can come together in sororidad and really name that and connect these, these struggles um, to what's happening in, in Guatemala and El Salvador, right? And in, in Ecuador, I want to just name um, this work has brought me some of my closest, dearest friends, you know, being able to find kindred um, hermanas and, and hermanas de lucha who are, who are gonna like <laughs> meet me at the march, you know, and, and um, who are ready to like speak out and um, tell their stories. Like, I'm really grateful. I think of Rosita Ivana from Justicia para Vanessa, who uh, her, her cousin was murdered and she, she is, is she's in Ecuador um, and she was so committed to telling her story, you know, and to organizing those marches and um, she's now a filmmaker. So the way that we're able to alchemize these experiences and really um, dispel that, that shame and that victim blaming that causes us to stay quiet or causes us to bypass our own grief, right? To be able to move through that and then really share. Also, I wanna uplift um, the East Side Mujeres Network. Um, Justice for My Sister was one of the founding members along with Mujeres de Maiz and Proyecto Pastoral. Um, Eastside, Eastside, uh, or East LA Women's Center as well. And then the Ovarian Psychos also became a part of it. And um, uh, we were organizing around Lorenza Ariano. Um, and when she was uh, somebody who had been living in Proyecto Pastoral and then um, her body um, was discovered um, at, at Belvedere Park at the lake. And so just naming um, that in light of, and, and kind of in response to these, these crimes and these losses, we've been able to create community. And I think through that community, through that sisterhood, um, we find the healing, you know, and when I'm not able to process my own grief or access it, I can, I can access it on behalf of somebody else. So um, I'm grateful for that opportunity to, to, to share with all of you and create that, that sisterhood and to continue to build those relationships, you know, and nurture those connections and, um, and also to envision the world that we want, you know, so much of the work, I think as activists, like it's easy to get burnt out and to really look at all the things that are going wrong. Right. And then how do we imagine what a healthy relationship looks like, right? How do we how do we create that for ourselves? How do we imagine the world, the community that we want to live in, right? That has community gardens and where we're, you know, like I'm a little bit struggling with the cold right now. I went over and I saw some of my relatives yesterday. They gave me some mullein plant, right? I made some tea. I brought over some lemons. And so it's like that exchange, you know. Um, and how can we envision that and, and hold space for the next generations and model for them what it means to be to be a community, to care for each other, to care for ourselves, too. Thank you so much for joining us to the Harnessing Our Collective Stories panel platica for the Shinachli Comadres National Colectiva. Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls Day of Action. This was such a heart-rooted, tender conversation. And we are so grateful that you have chosen to listen to the collective stories that surface and have bared witness to the power of community care and healing-centered work. We are truly not meant to do this work alone. We want to offer a heartfelt thank you to our organizational sponsors, which include Los Angeles Indigenous Peoples Alliance, LIPA, the Shinachli Comadres National Colectiva, 
Colibri, Justice for My Sister, and last but not least, we would like to acknowledge grant makers for girls of color. We are so honored to be an inaugural grantee of the New Songs Rising Initiative, a partnership between 7th Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples and grant makers for girls of color with the goal to mobilize resources towards work that centers and supports Indigenous girls, their families, and their communities. We hope you enjoyed this panel platica, and we invite you to check out our website and check out the rest of the activities that we have uh, for today's Day of Action. We also invite you to share this panel platica with your networks, on your social media, or, or on your email list. Thank you once again, and we hope you have a good rest of your day. Tlasokamati.